Have you guys ever had questions about training or the style of training or the different periodization? Well, I have legendary trainer Eric Brozier here. We're going to dive deep into training and all the peripheral things here on Too Much Tips podcast, episode 23. How you guys doing? It was, uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not used to. I'm not used to doing the the intro for this podcast. <laughs> I could tell it was a little bit, you know, shaky. <laughs> a little bit awkward. Uh, Tester levels good. normally. Tester levels normally does the uh, intro for these yeah. podcasts, but um, thank you for coming on, Eric. Appreciate it. Nah, no problem. Glad to be here. Uh, what? What? Uh, I, w- I wanted to talk to you about training. We had text a little bit, but. I'm curious because I've never really followed any pre- training protocol. I don't know if you guys have, but I've never really followed any pre- training pro- protocol. I just kind of made it up if I went along or like, oh, he does something that's kind of interesting. Let me incorporate that. And I know you work with a lot of clients. I'm curious to know what your like philosophy is or how you do go, like what's your approach on that? That is a complex question. We could probably spend like five podcasts on that. So I'll try to be semi brief about it. So, I, you know, I've been uh, a trainer for, gosh, probably almost 30 years now. I mean, I I did it in back when I lived in New York. I I used to train people in their homes. Um, I, you know, then, you know, started doing it in gyms. Eventually, I opened up my own gym. I had my own uh, basically personal training studio in New York, uh, which was all by appointment only, very upscale. Um, that became kind of like my lab, um, uh, where I started to develop a lot of my techniques because what I, what I, you know, I, I was never one to just, uh, take anything at face value and I was never one to just look at, you know, a pro train and go, Oh, he's big. Let me train like that. Or, or, you know, look at, you know, read a book and say, well, you're supposed to do five sets of bench press, five sets of ink, you know, I just never looked at it and said, it's it's not that simple. So, you know, a lot of my education uh, when I went to university um, was, it was partially psychology and and a lot of human anatomy, anatomy, physiology, kineology. I was able to really couple um, psychology with, uh, you know, training uh, and how how the body and the mind work together. So, one of the philosophies I have is number one is that you can't separate the mind and the body. So the ability for the human body to, um, you know, simply focus uh, on a task and make things happen is, is is very powerful. So in other words, there's been studies done that show that if you are able to, you know, hook up electrodes to runners' legs and have them focus very very strongly on running a race imagine it visualize it the the muscle fibers the muscle fibers in their legs will start firing without them actually moving at all which goes to show just how powerful the mind and the body are connected so one of the first things that i adopted into my philosophy of training is to go beyond um just having proper technique but to make sure that you're immensely focused and immersed in what you're doing. So if you're training the chest, you know, shut out the entire outside world, focus on, um, you know, feeling the chest stretch, feeling it contract, feeling every centimeter of the movement from during the eccentric or negative portion and the concentric, the positive portion, really get in touch. So when they say that mind muscle connection, um, really dive deep into that because that is something that I don't think enough people take true advantage of. They just kind of lift mindlessly and they, you know, they, they've done number, many, many studies, uh, having, you know, people split into two groups where they're both doing barbell curls with proper techniques. One of them is watching one group, maybe watching a television set while doing the reps. The other one is deeply focusing on what they're doing. And they show that the amount of muscle fiber activation in the people that are focusing versus the people watching the television set, there's a huge disparity, obviously much more happening um, with the people who are focusing and that's going to translate to growth over time. So how, how do you, how do you go through and like, 
train that. Uh, and so you're working with a client, right? And I think we all agree with that, or at least understand the value of increasing your mind, mind muscle connection. Because there's other studies uh, around mental practice that show for sports, whether it's soccer or like violin, not that that's necessarily a sport, but that practicing it mentally, hey, I'm going to go through this note, then go through this note, go through this note, improves performance. So how do you go through yeah. and like work with your clients to increase their mind muscle connection? Because those are going to be practical takeaways people could utilize. Yeah, well, I mean, for some people, it's not enough to just say, this is what I want you to do, you know, because, and some people are better focuses than others. You know, some people are able to do this much more easily. And some people are very, very distracted. So for the people who are more distracted, I, I developed a technique I, many, many years ago that I just called GIT, which is G-I-T, uh, short for get in touch. Um, what I'll have them do, let's just use um, a seated cable row as an example. Before I will even have them uh, grab the actual handle and do the actual exercise, I'll have them mimic the exercise. So I'll have them, you know, pretend that they're grabbing maybe a close grip handle. And I will say, now, I just want you to close your eyes. I'll, I'll usually I'll put my my hands on the area of the body that I want them to feel, because I, I whenever you, you know, press into the area, it, it, it creates an automatic connection for the person. So they know this is where they need to feel. it, And I'll tell them. We're now going to begin the movement very, very slowly. I want you to start to pretend you're pulling a weight back, but obviously there's no weight there. So you have to create the tension yourself in your mind. So I want you to feel where my hands are as you're pulling the weight back, this area of the muscle, so that they're not thinking about their biceps, they're not thinking about their shoulders, they're thinking about this area of the back. Then I'll have them bring it back very, maybe four to five, six seconds. And then when they reach the contraction point, they'll say, squeeze the muscle right here. Feel where I want you to feel it, right where my hands are. And then I'll do the same thing with the concentric. And then even at the stretch portion, now I want you to stretch. I want you to feel the muscle stretch. So it's just kind of like a, uh, a way of before they even touch the weight. Because a lot of times, as soon as they grab a weight, their, the mind is like, I just got to get it from point A to point B. You know, I just, I'm just, I just need to move this. And, you know, obviously there's some merit in just using good form and doing that. There's going to be some ad adaptation that takes place and the muscle's going to grow. But that's only to get you so far. I'm, I'm looking long term. I'm looking to optimize every single rep of every single set. And that's actually something that I tell everybody. I say every rep is a set. Don't think of a set as 10 reps. Think of it as one rep 10 times. Okay. And that so helps you them too. I was, you if, you're, if you're just listening to this and you don't know who we are, I'm the least uh, well-versed in training in this whole group. So take anything that I say with a grain of salt, but I really like your technique and I kind of, I didn't stumble across it, but I was, I noticed one day when I was doing, uh, you know, flies on the pet deck, I noticed that toward the end, I closed my eyes and I wasn't counting reps and I, I noticed my chest more. I noticed the feeling more and I still subconsciously count sets or reps, but I just noticed when I closed my eyes and did, I wasn't really even trying to do it. But when I brought it in there, I felt my chest more and I've been kind of trying to do that more mentally. And I, I do, I think there's a lot of merit in that. And especially the mind connection. You know, there's people that, have you ever heard of phantom pains? When people who have amputated yeah, yeah. Uh, limbs and they can still feel like itching or, or an itch on where there's no leg, but their nerves are still firing somehow or some way. And the, so the mind's super powerful. Yeah, so absolutely. I did have a question for you really fast. So just a little brief background. Uh, my coach and mentor was John Meadows uh, up until he passed. And so I'm, I'm very, very versed in coaching or very, not very versed in coaching, very versed in uh, training and stuff like that. So I do love uh, your uh, application of getting mind to muscle connections and focusing on the eccentric and the concentrics and the different pieces of it, basically getting ready to uh, move. It's almost like cat cow position for yoga. You can basically activate every single vertebrae and it actually helps to decompress that spine over time because you know how to activate your lower back properly. Now, I did want to ask a question kind of because we're talking about mind to muscle connection and I'm going to talk about muscle growth over time. And I'm just curious to hear your opinion on it because I know what my answer is, but I'm curious to hear yours. If you're doing basically progressive overload over time, right? So we're you have one person that's solely focused on perfect form and execution. The next person is focused on volume, 
weight times reps per day and overloading the body as much as they can. Over a one year period of time, who would have better muscle growth? And this is extreme conditions because you're having one person literally focus on perfect execution all the time and only mind to muscle connection. And then the other one, you're just focusing on solely weight and basically overloading over the time with just volume. So I would just be curious to hear your response there. You know, that's a, I mean, that's, it's an interesting question and it's a tough one to answer because I, I, it's, I, my question, see, I'd have to ask a question back to you and I'd be like, well, is that person who's focusing on form still trying to progress over time or are they using the same weight, the same movements, everything for the straight year? Because there needs to be some type of progression. Right. Because so they, they, they would, as long as their form is absolutely perfect. And that's all that they mainly are focusing on. That is their pivot point is that form is perfect. If their form is perfect, they can increase that load um, as well until their form is perfect again. And then they can increase their load again. But the other person is just straight up going for just straight volume. Okay. For the, I would, the, my, I would say, I'll say my opinion. I'm not going to state it because maybe other coaches have had different experiences, but I'm going to say this is fact for me doing this for 30 years working with everybody from complete beginners to Olympia level athletes. Perfect form for me is going to win out pretty much every time Um, or almost every time, you know, you're going to have freaks of nature. If somebody points to Ronnie Coleman or Jay Cutler, who I'm good friends with and says, well, look how they train their form sucked, but they got strong. I'm going to say, okay, so you're basically pointing to Michael Jordan and saying you playing basketball versus them. Okay, that's not going to happen. There's people who can pick up a guitar, never took a lesson in their life, and they start playing it. I don't know how that happens because if I took guitar lessons for five years, I can't even, I can do none of it. So I I suck at it. So that's who they are. So you you can't point to that population. Those are the elite of the elite. So for most people, I'm going to say that if you have perfect form, um, because you need to engage your, your, the, the point of training is not basically, always to lift heavier lifting getting stronger is a finite thing you cannot get stronger forever that does not happen otherwise we'll be bench pressing houses that doesn't happen not to mention side note your joint integrity is going to fail at certain points injury is going to start to occur and i'll point back to my friend randy coleman again who's now on his 50th surgery or something like that (laughs) so Increasing tension on the muscle is what makes a muscle grow. The muscle knows tension. It does not know weight per se. If you pick up a 100-pound dumbbell, your muscles don't go, wow, we have a 100-pound dumbbell in our hand. Because I could pick up a 20-pound dumbbell, and I guarantee I can get more tension out of that 20-pound dumbbell than most people can a 60-pound dumbbell. So it's creating tension, which is done through the mind-muscle connection, done through proper form. And then we will also get to some stuff beyond just proper form that will increase tension even more, which is some of my time under tension techniques. So my answer to that question in a very simple way would be I would go for the perfect form and technique and overload progressing in some way, shape or form um, over that period of time versus just purely like I'm lifting more weight for more volume. So therefore I'm great. Okay, so I'm going to contradict you here, and I'm going to say that the person that would be focused on solely volume would obtain more muscle tissue over that period of time because the level of progress would be very, very slow. Um, now, it obviously would come into like experience of the lifter and stuff like that. A newbie lifter is going to get crazy progress with volume. Um, now, an experienced lifter is going to have issues with joint integrity again because they will be increasing strength over a period of time if they're focusing solely on mind to muscle connection. What I have personally learned best for me is incorporating, obviously, volume is obviously the, tr- the easiest way to track weight times reps kind of thing. Um, but incorporating that mind to muscle connection does increase muscle hypertrophy on the muscle groups that you're trying to target. So that mind to muscle connection that you're referring to. But that overload is literally the tried and true. So obviously in bodybuilding, when we're trying to grow muscle tissue in certain areas, that amount of muscle connection, and I, I'm in agreement, by the way, with you. And like if you had overloading with great form and you checked yourself and form checked yourself while you're trying to overload, 100%, I think that there needs to be strength cycles cycled in 
Um, and that's what I learned best for me. But you always have to form check while you're doing your strength progression. And I only do like one month to two months max a year of a strength progress because then the neurotransmitters in the brain, they're like, okay, I can lift this weight. And then you back it back down and you just focus on solely perfect form and overloading and you're lifting more weight at that point in time. There's a, there's like a million different ways to overload and to tra track intensity varies a lot of like time under tension, like what you're going to jump into here soon. But um, yeah, so I, I would say actually the opposite. I would say the volume, a person that's focused on volume over that year period of time would obtain more muscle tissue if they're not getting injured, right? That's, that's a big variable is the injury. Um, if you're getting injured, it sets you back and you're not going to make progress during that time. Well, I don't think that we're real. I mean, I, I don't think for the listeners that we're really talking about things completely differently because yeah. I'm not saying you know, don't try to get stronger. Don't try to bench more weight or, you know, or there may be some times where uh, increasing because you have to remember the word volume means a lot of different things to different people. So volume to most people will mean, well, you know, 12 sets is working for me. So maybe 15 sets will work better, you know? Yeah. Um, and that also is a very slippery slope because then you get into recovery issues and every, there are people who can withstand uh, 30 sets per body part. And there are people who cannot, who like Doran Yates, who would do six or seven or eight pure sets and obviously only Olympia six times. So we're not really saying completely, completely different things because to a degree, I agree with you. There are, there are, there is room for some power bodybuilding with some strength cycles. And I'm not saying that shouldn't be done. I'm saying that I think I'm going a little bit more towards maybe, um, or maybe I misinterpreted your question, going more towards moving the weight from point A to point B for more reps or heavier weight is more important than focusing solely on form. And there I would completely disagree with you hundred percent because, and, and there's a degrees of bad form too. Listen, there's pathetic form, you know, <laughs> it looks like they're going to break, you know, they're going to break Perfect the back versus looser form, which maybe is where like a, you know, uh, Branch Warren, Ronnie Coleman, those kind of people come into, you know, they found a form that worked for them. Obviously, no one's going to disagree with that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the most people aren't going to grow best from that. They're going to grow best by creating tension in the muscles um, by having perfect form and then getting to other. Um, but you need progressive overload. And sometimes there's going to be room with clients I've had. I've experimented. I've said, OK, we're doing uh, great on 10 sets. Let's try 14 sets it may work it may not work there's going to be a threshold for everybody you have to figure that out um which is you know part art part art part science um so uh, you know i don't think i don't think that you and i are very far off what you're saying uh, yeah. to tell you the truth yeah, no, I, so I, I'm in complete agreement with you, by the way. I just want to give you two completely extreme cases because we're on the mind and muscle connection thing. And I do like, it's like splitting hairs kind of because you do need a happy medium between the both. Um, and I think anyone disagreeing with that statement is reading too many studies and needs to look at relative experience and what actually happens in reality uh, because we're not machines. And you should also know that John Meadows is one of the, several few trainers in the industry that I had great respect for. I didn't know him personally. Uh, was He was so upset at his passing. Uh, so to me, he was a colleague. So, you know, I, he was he was a great man and he was a great trainer. So just know yeah. that. I had a quick, just a quick note. It's interesting. It's, uh, it's interesting because I'm not in this industry to see people like talk about, argue about different ways to build muscle and, you know, progressive overload volume, all that stuff. I was reading the book that I sent to Dave and Sam. I can't remember the name of the book, but it's like a massive anabolic book. But he was going into the into a chapter where it's talking about actually how muscle grows, how there's like satellite receptors that get like triggered by this and this. And then he basically said like, this is, we, we generally believe this to be true, but we really don't actually know exactly how the mechanism works. So I found that kind of interesting that how advanced we are as a civilization, we still don't know how we actually, actually build muscle, like, you know, down. So just found that interesting. And I had a quick question for you guys. So you see lots of videos on training, you know, all the, everyone puts out training videos, all the big guys. And they say, they talk about doing certain stuff, like how much of those little variations that they do to add more muscle, how much does that impact the average person? Like, so if I do exactly what Seth Ferrosi does or Ronnie Coleman, or I follow their exact plan and I'm just a normal dude, like, am I going to put on an extra pound, a half a pound, five pounds? 
Because a lot of these arguments for different stuff and different stuff, we're talking about people, you know, like all three of you guys that are jacked and uh, jacked and juicy. We're talking about massive bodybuilders and how little tiny differences can can win or lose shows. But for me, you know, I'm probably 18, 20 percent body fat. You know, does that act? Does all this stuff really make any fucking bit of difference to me or is it just for elite people at the top level? Eric, I want to hear your opinion on this. Well, I mean, I think that. um this is where coaching comes into play. You know, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, never had a coach, you know, coaching is a relatively new, you know, relatively new thing, I think, you know, to the, to the way that I do it, um, you know, but, you know, whatever, 30 years ago, people don't generally have coaches. They'd read magazine articles in muscle and fitness or flex, or they'd watch a video and, you know, of their favorite bodybuilder and they'd follow the routine and they would maybe get some results, but, um, you know, because anything that's novel to the body and novel stimulus is going to, is going to create growth. Um, but the body is a, the human, the human body is like the most incredibly adaptable machine, you know, computer on earth. And, you know, you can follow that routine for a little while and then it's going to stall. It's going to plateau. So even whatever, whatever routine that you probably read that your favorite pro was doing, uh, is probably not what they were always doing. It's probably not what they were doing when they first started out. And it's probably not what they did at their next workout, you know, so um, it's just really just, a, you know, maybe what they did at their last workout. And then they had an article written about it, you yeah. know, but as a coach, you know, you know, one thing that I hate about the coaching industry is, but there's so many coaches out there that do cookie cutter programs. And, you know, so they basically have five clients who come to them. They could be completely differently genetically, um, com at completely different levels of of body fat, uh, age, whatever, anything, testosterone levels, any, and they get the same program. Um, so obviously their results are going to vary based on how closely that program may fit their profile. What I do with every single person, every single person that I work with um, has a completely different training program, completely different diet, completely different supplement program based on the information that I get from them, which I do through a questionnaire. So not trying to promote my coaching. All I'm saying is that for somebody like you, um, you would need somebody to really uh, opt to be optimal in making progress. You would need somebody to come in there and say, Hey, let me ask the right questions, find out where you're at and then build a program based on what your goals are, where your body is. Um, and then as you progress over time, you begin to learn that person's body, you see the results you're getting, and then a good coach will make adjustments based on those results or lack thereof, and then maybe change the program, maybe slightly, maybe completely. Maybe it might just be a matter of switching the exercises every week. You know, with most of my people, uh, I change their higher level people, not beginners. Some of the, you know, some of the beginners may stick to the same program for four weeks, um, some of the higher level people might be having their programs change literally every single week. It depends on the experience level. So, you know, to, to try to answer your question, you probably would get some results for a little while using program A, B, or C. Um, but it'll probably stall out on you because it's not built for you. It's like, you know, putting, you know, it's like putting uh, in a high powered engine, putting the worst gasoline. You may, your car will still move. It's just not going to go from zero to 60 like it's supposed to. So it's that's... It's yeah. A lot of what you're saying sounds uh, very similar to the way uh, I've like been training. And we, you talked about progressive overload. You guys all have mentioned pro progressive overload. Where a lot of the times when I've talked when I talk to people about progressive overload, they just see weight. Like, okay, progressive overload. That means I did 225 this week. So next week I got to do a little bit more. But there's so many different pieces to progressive overload can you talk about that and then touch on that technique you mentioned for yeah. increasing tension all right well i'll tell you this okay here's, here's, here's a good example okay um i am 53 like i know i look a lot younger but i'm 53 um when i was uh i don't know mid-20s late 20s whatever i was very into strength always had good form i never used sloppy form but i wanted to be the strongest guy in the gym so i lifted i went for weight um, at one point I was, uh, bench pressing, uh, 495, you know, I was, I was, you know, presses, you know, seated shoulder presses, 275, 
you know, I was, I, I was dumbbell curling with like 80 pounds. I was, I was strong. I was really strong and zero drugs. I should let you know. I was completely natural, just built up really good strength. I go into the gym now at, at my age now, I could not touch any of those weights. If I did, I'd break in half. Hence my knee injury. Okay. I don't even come close. In fact, I don't even care what weight I, I, I pick up. I pick up what I want to use to feel what I want to feel. I am back then I was probably carrying 230 pounds in decent shape. I'm about 265 now in better shape. Okay. Still on enough drugs. Okay. Nothing. Okay. I, okay. No, I started TRT two years ago to keep my levels even semi-normal. Okay. So that just goes to show you what progressive overload means and doesn't mean. I am lifting half the weight, maybe less in some cases that I used to, and I am way bigger than I was. And that progress happened within like the last 10 years when I started to reduce all that stuff down. I started to just say, you know what? I don't care about the weight anymore. I can't keep getting stronger. I'm never going to be the strongest guy in the gym. There's always going to be somebody stronger. I don't want, you know, injuries popping up all over the place. I want to start feeling, I want to start worrying less about can I get this weight from point A to point B, even a good form, and start to really get into my muscles and really feel what's going on. And that's when I started growing again. And I'm still growing. So, the progressive over, in fact, I've grown so much that I've, I, I retired from bodybuilding competition in 2011 was my last show. I did the Ironman naturally. I won. And then I didn't, I didn't officially retire. I just went into business and I just focused on that. Now I'm thinking about coming back and going for my master's pro card. And it's only because of what I've accomplished over the last 10 years without, you know, with these, with the methodology that I've sort of been describing. And I'll go into a little further if you want to. Please. Um so I don't know if that really answers your progressive overload question, but you're right when you say that it doesn't always mean you have to put five more pounds on the bar. And that's what I mean. When I say progressing, I mean progressing in your mind-muscle connection, pro progressing in in how much you're st stretching and squeezing, progressing in, you know, in making your form even better, figuring out how to feel the muscles more where you want to feel them and not just moving it for pointing. So there's a lot of methods to progressive overload that are not necessarily, I mean, the overload word is probably where it comes in when you start thinking about weight, but progression does not have to come through lifting heavy weight. I think it's a great thing in the beginning. I think when you're young and you're first starting out, you need to get stronger. You need to get stronger, especially in the basic, basic lifts. You need to do a lot of free weight compound movements. All that stuff is true. You need to build a foundation. But then the point comes where that does not mean as much and you have to start finding other ways to grow because the body is not going to give a crap that you're benching, you know, 475 now when you're only doing 450 at some point. It's not going to care. The muscles are going to, your body's going to adapt to it. Your central nervous system is going to adapt to it and you're not going to grow as much anymore. So what about your That's really interesting. I just real quick, I'll let Sam, I've been talking a lot this episode, but well, I want to tell you my theory on working out. And after you guys are all done laughing at me, you can tell me why I'm wrong. So, <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just an amateur dude. I'm on TRT. I've run cycles. I've done stuff like that, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a monster like Sam and David over here. So my general philosophy of going to the gym is, is very similar to what you, what you do. I don't care about weight. I go for, you know, I probably do roughly, I would say in the range of uh, 12 to 20 reps, um, but I don't really, I don't have a set program. I don't have, okay, I'm going to do 15, 15, 12, 10, anything like that. I, and I don't have any, when I wake up in the morning, I have no idea what exercises I'm going to do. I know I'm going in to do chest. I don't know if I'm getting on a flat bench. I don't know if I'm doing dumbbells. I don't know if I'm going to do more incline. So my thought process there is that I'm randomizing the exercises that I do so my body doesn't get used to it. And by not counting reps and just going to failure, you know, if I do 15 and I, and I can still have another one in the tank, I feel like if I just do it till I pretty much can't do it, that, that I'm tearing down my muscles as much as possible. So I'll let you guys rip that apart. 
Yeah, so I'm I'm going to just speak to that. So when I was coming out of college, um, I'm just going to talk about like when I was injury free and then I eventually started getting injured. Um, I was focused on like waiting for reps and kept getting really good progress until you start getting injured. And then when you get injured, you can no longer make progress anymore. And it's a setback, not a step forward. Um, when it comes to training and I was healthy and I was going to the gym, no plan, non-structured, failure training. It was one of the biggest setbacks I ever had in my lifting career. Now, I think that you should have your two to three movements that are staples that work for you. For instance, flat bench is garbage for my shoulder. So I think it's a, honestly a pointless movement unless if you're a power lifter. I really, unless if it's like a dumbbell or something like that, and you're focused more on like that stretch or something like that, mind to muscle kind of stuff. Um, but I think that. A decline dumbbell is really good. And I love Smith machine incline. That's what works best for me. So that's always going to be a staple. I'm going to try to overload with those movements over time. And like uh, Eric was saying and alluded to is there's a million different ways you can overload it. You can overload it and you can reverse band it to take tension off your shoulders if your shoulders aren't feeling good. So you can take um, tension off there and you can focus on more of a mind and muscle connection, more of that contra contraction rather than a heavy stretch on the bottom <laughs> It can be putting tension on that shoulder. Um, you should have as a as a for legs, you should have some type of squat movement. It doesn't have to be a barbell squat in there. You should have some type of leg press in there of some variation, and you should have variables that you can track. Otherwise, you're kind of shooting in the dark. Another thing that is you is an issue with failure training, which I'm a huge fan of failure training. I personally believe that there should be failure built into training programs, no matter what. Like you should have a set or two sets a week, probably where you go to a failure. Now, people's failure is not people's true failure. The mechanical failure is where you're basically injuring yourself or breaking down. Um, but what I will say to that is when I do my training, I will do three sets of X amount of reps and have some traceable variables. I will try to beat it that next week to the best of my ability. And I will stick to that and master that movement and continue to build a mind to muscle connection. So I'm optimizing those movements and I'm still making progress over that time. Um, if you do not have variables to track, again, you're shooting in the dark. If you do a failure set on your first rep or your first set, then you're shooting yourself in the foot to optimize how many reps you can do on your next sets and you risk injury. So I like doing personally, like if, let's say we're doing three sets on incline bench press, whatever. I would do basically 12 reps, then the next set 12 reps. And the next set, if you're going to failure, you go to a failure. But if you're not getting 12 reps, then you should try to get to 12 reps the next week. This way you're progressing over that period of time. But you also didn't shoot yourself in the foot by going to failure training. Let's say you got 15 reps on the first set and then you got you dropped five reps on the second one. So now you're getting 10 reps and then you go to a failure again. That was 10 reps. And then the next set you're doing six reps. You actually obtain less volume over time and your wrist injury on three sets in a row, and you're probably getting tendon and joint breakdown over that period of time. So that's kind of my philosophy on that is I love the major comp. Well, ma by major compound movements, it, does, it can be machine, for instance. It doesn't really matter, but you need those staples in there that you're tracking and progressing with. And I also believe that you do need minimum two sets to three sets, and the first set should never be failure. If you're going to fail out, um, it's either going to be like, some type of heavy stimulus, like a cluster set where you're failing on it, where it's less weight and stuff like that. And you're just basically getting optimal blood flow at any type of failure, but without risking too much injury, like risk first reward becomes very important when you're looking at longevity and growing muscle tissue over time so that you don't get injured. Let me, I'll just, I'll clarify. So I don't just, I don't, I'm not going on leg day and just doing like, you know, just doing extensions and, and curls and stuff like that. So when I walk in and I'm doing back, I'm going to be doing, trying to hit all the muscles. So I'll do pull downs on the machine. Then I'll do close grip rows. Then I'll do, you know, kind of wide grip pull downs. And then I'll do like the ropes. So it's, it's, it's not planned. You know, I may do ropes. I may do the pullover, but I'm still trying to hit all the core movements for that muscle. Are you, are you, let me ask you this question. Are you getting the results that you want to get from trading? Um, muscle wise, muscle wise, I'm actually not too unhappy about it. It's just, it's just weight. It's just that I'm a little overweight. So it's foreshadowed. Well, that, has, that has very little to do with your working out. So obviously it has to do with your diet and, and or cardio. So that's why I was asking because you're saying, you know, this is my training philosophy. If you're getting, listen, if somebody says to me, I'm going to the gym 
and and they're doing this and it sounds pretty wrong to me and and i say well are you happy yeah i'm happy what am i going to say to them okay you're happy you didn't <laughs> say to me how can i get more and then i sit there and tell them more if they're happy they're happy so i mean you're happy with that and i think that you know what you're describing maybe i there's a difference to me a huge difference to me and as a coach this is what i have to find especially when i'm working with pros what's the difference between what's working and what's working optimally you know can you tell me if you you know if you're working at 85% of what you know you're you know you're getting 85% okay so you're growing you're doing a little better you're growing a little muscle blah blah, blah. that's awesome my job is to find out what gets you from that 85 to 100% or close to it so maybe you're going to the gym and what you're doing is working for you you're satisfied with your gains do i think it's optimal to have like no plan no I think you need to have somewhat of a plan. doesn't mean that it's got to be like crazy nuts. Like you go to the gym, I'm going to do this exercise. This, like, you know, sometimes you might get to the gym, this machine's taken. So you got to switch, you know, like uh, David was saying, there are certain core movements that should be in there. They don't have to be, Hey, maybe bench presses works great for you. You don't get injured. It works for you. If it doesn't, I got rid of bench presses and squats long ago. I got rid of deadlifts too. That was messing up my back. But it has certain core movements that I that I replace them with. It could be on machine, whatever. So with David, I agree with that. One of the things that you are doing is you're pretty much pushing. Forget about you know what David was saying with the first set and, and injury. You're pretty much pushing to failure, like you said. You're trying your hardest. That's going to go a long way versus people who go to the gym and do eight reps when they really have 15 in the tank. So I mean, you're at least doing some good things that are getting you results. Um, and you can continue on that path. Forget about the weight stuff because that's a different, a completely different talk. Um, but as far as training wise, you're not getting hurt. You're progressing. Fine. If you came to me and said, hey, Eric, I want to progress more. I'm going to tell you how to do that. I'm going to tell you where the holes are in your program, what to do. But I don't think there's necessarily I'm not going to say, oh, you, what you're doing sucks because you are doing some things. You're getting to the gym, number one. You're being consistent, number two. You're beating every, a lot of people right there. You're working hard, number three. Doesn't sound like you're doing anything unreasonable, number four, what some people do. So, I mean, you know, some people spend an entire chest work on the cable crossover machine screaming and yelling and thinking, why don't I have a big chest? Well, that's because you don't lift a goddamn dumbbell or a barbell or do any presses on the Smith machine or anything. So, I mean, that's my answer to you is that your pro program is probably pretty good. It's not necessarily optimal. And I'm the Mr. Optimization guy. I have no choice. You know, I get a pro who comes to me and says, you know, I'm coming in fifth place. It shows I want to win them, but I've been training for 20 years. What do I need to do different? You know, I got to figure that out. I'll give you a really quick example. And then if you want, I'll go into just a couple of more techniques that I was talking about. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, maybe David, maybe Sam, maybe you know a bodybuilder named Silvio Samuel. He was very, very high level pro years ago. Um, I think he got up to like seventh place in the Mr. Olympia. He won a bunch of pro shows. Um, I met him at Gold's Gym a few years ago. He talked about wanting to work with me because he was working. He was actually working with, with uh, another another big trainer. I'm not going to mention his name, but he was working with a very big trainer. And he just felt like he wasn't getting anything more out of it. He wasn't growing anymore. He wanted to make a big comeback into the sport. So he finally asked me to take over his training. My training was completely different than what he was doing before. He was just basically doing a ton of volume, you know, tons of exercises, lots of sets, lots of reps, maybe going to failure, maybe not. A lot of haphazard training movements that I think would, you know, like, it's like doing a barbell press and an incline dumbbell press, doubling up on them, things you don't need to be doing. Um, obviously, he was an IFBB pro, so I'm not going to say you suck because he was one of the best in the world and looked amazing. But he wanted to get to that next level. I started training him within a few months. Everybody was coming up to him going, holy crap, Sam, so you look, you're huge. You got huge all of a sudden. And he would say, that's because I'm training his way. His way is completely different. I feel so much more. I'm getting sore again, blah, 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 so on, so on and so forth. So that's what I'm talking about. Finding, even though you've reached a certain point, there's usually something that you're not doing. You could be doing better. And some, one of the things you got to know about the pros, I'll just throw it out there. And this is not a knock on any pro. Um, not, a lot of the pros don't necessarily know a lot. They're not necessarily that educated in training. They're just freaking gifted and hard workers. You know, they're, they bust their ass. They have amazing genetics. And they go in there and they and they work their ass off and they get but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a coach. 
That doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to train other people better. You know, they don't even necessarily know how to train themselves. They're just getting results, not because of what they're doing, despite what they're doing, you know. And, you know, he was kind of an example. And I'm not saying because he's a coach now, too, and I'm not saying anything about him or anybody in particular. I'm just saying a lot of people go, well, let me go to that guy because he's the biggest guy in the gym and ask him how he got that big. There may be a small guy in the corner who knows a fuck a lot more about training (laughs) than that big guy because they've studied it. They've learned it. They've, you know, whether it be university or whatever. um, And even though I became a natural pro back years ago and I've competed and I've won shows and all those kinds of stuff, my education came through self, through, you know, observation, learning, learning on people. Plus, I studied in the school. Plus, I have like 10 certifications. Plus, I read everything I get my hands on. I would just became like a learning machine. And like, I want to know why we grow, what makes us grow, what mechanisms make us grow, what the hell is going on and what I could do in the gym. Let me check it out. Let me try it for real and see if what I'm reading in the books Happens in, happens in the trenches because that's what's important. Just like a supplement. If somebody says seven times scientific studies say that this fucking herb makes you get gain 15 pounds, but if it doesn't work in the gym, then, then it's not working. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I just want to comment to that. I would I want to approach the person that would be working with the pros anyways. Like I never I followed all the coaches because I used to but before I was like uh coaching like I do myself right now. But um I used to follow the coaches of the pros. And then the other thing is, is I want to work with someone that is not genetically blessed, that has to squeeze every smart ounce of brain out of themselves and get to where they are. John took him almost 30 years to turn pro and he had to put like, he had amazing arms and he goes, they were the hardest things on my body to grow were my arms and my calves. And he trained his calves daily and he, he had to find out the most optimal to train his uh, arms, which is not easy. And I'm in the same boat. He's always poke fun of me. Like how's the arm training going? Cause I like peanut butter spread the volume through the week. Um, to, and that's what worked for me. Um, so I, I just wanted to like say kudos there for you pointing that out because it's hundred percent true. Uh, the hardest worker and the smartest worker in the room and like take that person that had to work so hard to build a physique and they probably know more than almost everyone else in the room. And it just yeah. is what it is. Yeah. When I started, li- when I started lifting, I was the same height I am now, which is five eleven and a half, and I weighed 125. I had, I had zero muscle in my body. I looked like just a stick. So everybody said to me when I started bodybuilding, they were like, well, you're not going to really get anywhere with this. Why even try? Why are you working so hard? And I'll be like, well, I'll show you, you know, and you know, I did, I didn't really know. I'm like, I'm just going to, the more people told me I can't do it, you know, the made me want to do it. And really, nobody supported me except for my training partner. And, uh, you know, by the time I was 21, I turned pro in a natural organization. I've already, I was on the cover of Iron Man magazine. I've, I've, if you know my, my bio and my resume, it's very, very extensive. And I've worked for every single inch of it. Um, but I was certainly not genetically gifted one. And I did not have a mentor. Everything I learned on my own. You know, I want to I want to ask I want to ask you a selfish question uh, related to training. Uh, I've got it sounds like similar philosophy in how I approach it, where the weight just doesn't matter to me at all. I have generally speaking a couple things that I'm doing for say chest. There's a couple primary things that I'll do for that leg day, but all the peripheral stuff besides those like couple exercises could be completely different and even the reps on those things could be completely different but there's certain periods of my training throughout the year where i might go eight reps but then other points in the year or and it might not be like terribly far apart but i might do eight reps and then go all the way up to sets with 100 reps but very it's like barely any weight you know what i mean i'm doing like I'll do mid grip rows, but what I was doing last week. And I wanted to hear your th- thoughts on like that spectrum because you have the weight piece of it. You have like mind muscle connection. You also have, excuse me, where you can just lots of different reps, but still focusing on like the contraction of every single movement. And if you're missing it in that last third of a portion of a rep, then that's the portion that needs work on. Right. Like on whether you're doing the, the contraction portion of it or the eccentric portion of it. And I want to hear your thoughts on like the rep ranges that you use or how you utilize those. 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let this kind of lead into, um, and I hope that we're not going too long here. If you want to keep on, I'm good. Um, I'll, let this lead, I'll let this lead into some of the other things that I've found that works, and this is what I use with people. First of all, like I said before, the human body is incredibly adaptable. It learns what you're doing, figures it out, hacks it, and just says, well, we're not going to respond to it anymore. And that even happens with diet. You know, it's, it's how we're built. I mean, it's how we're built to survive. I mean, it has nothing to do with body, but not body. Um, not to mention the fact that the human body, its number one goal is to survive. It does not want to carry more muscle mass. If anything, it wants to carry more body fat. So basically, what everything we would do, we have to force it to make it happen. Now, I'm going to separate this conversation to somebody like you, you know, who's been probably been training for a long time. The beginners, that's a different subject. Now, let's go into really, really experienced lifters. Once you get to a point where you're really experienced, and that could be, you know, 10 years of lifting or whatever consistently or you know, even more. Some guys, 10, 20 years, 30 years. Um, you feel like you've pretty much done it all, you know, like, so what what is the body not done? What do you got to do? You have to start doing things like you're doing. You need the we do not grow because of, there's not just one pathway to growth. There's multiple. OK, you know, everything from fiber trauma to, you know, uh, cell volumization with blood and all kinds. There's many mechanisms that make us grow. It's not like testosterone is the only hormone that makes us grow. It's a myriad of hormones. It's a cascade. So we have to tap into all of it. If you're only tapping into one thing, even when somebody comes to me and says, I don't know, Eric, for the last year, I've been trained. I've been trained in a failure, perfect form. I've been concentrating. I've been, been every exercise has been six to eight reps. But I said, well, there's a problem. You've been doing six to eight reps. You know, you've been training for 20. Your body is not going to respond after a while and you're not going to get any stronger. And if you do, you're probably going to hurt yourself. So we need to find other ways to make ourselves grow. So what you're doing to me is excellent. Yes. Have a period of time where, or even if it's just a week, because the more experienced you are, the faster your body adapts, okay? So you may be adapting to a program in a week. You don't even know. I, I switch so, it up weekly, but sorry, go ahead. Week, that's so great. So, so six to eight reps. I, I prefer, I don't like talking about reps so much because I like talking about time and detention because six to eight reps done with a one second up, one second down is a hell of a lot different than with a four second eccentric and a two second positive, one second hold at the bottom. Your time and detention is completely different. But yes, six to eight reps, then some days, a hundred reps, you know, then some days um, focusing on, and this is a lot of what, if you look up, I have several training techniques that are, you know, called, the first one I ever came out with is called Power Rep Rate Shock, which I came out with in 2001. There's been books on it. It's been a thousand articles on that one. That was my first one. Later on, I came out with something called FDFS, which is fiber, fiber damage, fiber, fiber saturation. Then I came out with something called ESPX2. And then I came out with all different types of training programs, which were meant to hit the muscles in the central nervous system uh, with just different bombs, just boom, 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 different things to make it grow. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, SPX2 means eccentric, stretch, <coughs> um, uh, SPX2, um, then contraction, and then high reps. So basically, the first movement will be, say, let's say we're doing chest, uh, flat dumbbell press or bench press, even or incline press, doesn't matter. Uh, we will accentuate the eccentric portion of the rep. We'll be looking for about a four to five second negative on every single set. OK, um, reps can be that can vary a lot. It could be it could be lower where you're going heavier, four to six. It could be a little bit higher, seven to nine, usually in that range. Um, so that'll be the first movement we're really looking to accentuate the eccentric portion the second movement we go to the stretch board and remember eccentric uh when you accentuate the, the, the eccentric portion of the rep that causes a lot of fiber damage fiber trauma that fiber trauma has to be repaired that means muscle growth another great way to cause fiber damage is through accentuating the stretch and i'm sure you've seen the studies out there where they put overloads on birds wings and just left a weight heavy on their wings, so it gets a stretch on it, then they take the weight off, and the, the muscles of the wing has grown by like 30%. So then say the second movement is stretch. So we'll say we'll do a dumbbell fly. We can get a really big stretch. We'll go down to the – and everything, all the other parts of the rep are controlled, but not crazy holding. So then we go down into the stretch position. We hold that stretch position for four to five seconds, really getting the stretch. I tell people, open up their chest, let it drop. Of course, if you have bad shoulders – Got to be careful. I'm just talking about if you're completely healthy. 
Um, so the second movement will accentuate the stretch. Then the third movement, we go to contraction. Now we're going to work on the contracted portion. So I'll pick a movement that was is very, very strong in the contracted portion, maybe a seated fly machine where the, there's, or a cable crossover with this tension in the middle. And then we'll hold that contraction for four seconds. Now, in this, these first three movements, and this is only one of my training programs, just to give you an example. But these first three movements are going to cause a lot of fiber damage. So what I like to do for the fourth movement is get a lot of blood, ox blood oxygen, whatever supplement you're taking, into the muscle to begin the repair process. So we'll do a few sets of a high rep movement, usually 26 to 30 reps, something, something like that, with more of a piston-like quick movement under control just to force as much blood and volume as you possibly can and then to finish off the workout. So this is just an example of one of the ways that I look to, um, the, the, the different pathways that I'll look to hit a muscle within a workout um, because they're all different, they're all novel, they're all creating a different stimulus. Um, all, even though maybe the time under tension for those first three sets may be similar, um, the way you're achieving that time under tension is a little bit different. And you're forcing the muscle, you're forcing the muscle and the central nervous system and even the way you think to be different on all of those sets. So I think when you're ex an experienced lifter, you need to start to do those kinds of things to overload the body. It's not so easy to overload the body anymore as it used to be. So these are some of the types of techniques. And another thing I wanted to mention before we got off here is that I'm also very, very big on modifying angles. I think that the standard movements that we've all been using for the last gazillion years, lat pull downs, bent rows, seated cable rows, whatever it be, incline presses, any movement, people don't see, don't get outside that comfort zone. So if you actually, the easiest way from this, if you watch some of my videos on the Jay Cutler channel, the show is called People You will see that I, I do this most a lot with pros, is I change the angles of movements. I'm constantly changing angles, grips, and planes of motion because there are certain muscle fire. Just because you work a muscle to failure doesn't mean that you're actually exhausting every motor unit pool in that muscle. Because some of them are going to be missed because you may not be at the proper angle to hit certain muscle fibers. So for a good example is one of the things I'll do like on lat pull downs. You do the basic lat pull down with a wide grip. I'll bring an incline bench in there and I'll lean it forward at a certain angle. And I'll have the person keep keeping their chest on the, on the incline bench. And they'll pull a lat pull down from that forward stretch position. And then as they come back, then they squeeze. But just that change of angle, the change of path you'll feel your back differently than you did for regular lap pull downs, which means we're now affecting different muscle fibers. And I will do this. People always say they do incline dumbbell presses. They're always doing it at a 45 degree, degree angle. How about one set at a 60 degree? Then I bring it back to 45 degree, then bring it back to 30 degree. Get everything that you can out of the muscle by working it. If you're doing like even barbell bent rows, Go beyond shoulder width grip for one set, then shoulder width grip, then bring it inside shoulder width grip. Make the muscles in the central nervous system work differently, and then you will start to stimulate muscle fibers you never have before, and that is going to increase growth. I can promise you that because I do it with pros all the time, and they start. They tell me when the workout is over, they always say to me, I have never felt my muscles. Felt that part of my back. I've, I've always wanted to get to my lower inner lats. I was never able to, and I'm like, I'll show you how to do it. And I think we're losing me. Oh, I just there we go. I I learned to do that when I owned my own gym because I would literally sit there once I closed the gym down, and I'd stick I'd take equipment around the gym, and I'd be like. Hmm, I really want to figure out how to get to that area of the back or that area of the shoulder that I just can't always feel. How do I do it? And I would change the angle, change the grip, and change the angle, change the movement, pull from over, and pull this way, pull that way. And I go, oh, there I nailed it. And that's how I learned a lot of these these techniques, and I started to put them to, into my memory bank. And that's that's what got me to this point now where people, pros and high-level people who want to turn pro have started approaching me and say, you got to teach me how to do that. So Thank I've been I was very blessed to be able to do that. I'm blessed to be able to work with these people. Really thankful. 
Thank you. Be, thankful to be talking to you guys about this stuff because I love it. <laughs> uh, well, I want to acknowledge you for taking the time out of your day to share your knowledge with us. And uh, the big thing I'm going to take away, and then I also want to hear how people can get a hold of you if somebody wants to reach out uh, for training or follow along with your stuff or look into any of your content. But the the contraction movement, the stretch movement, and the eccentric, as that's the three sets, of, is, is how I perceive that. I think that's very unique, and I will be implementing that in the future. How can people reach out to you if they want to touch, touch base with get training? If you want to see me on Instagram, um, that's at Coach Eric Roser. Um, and then you can you know DM me there if you want to, again, touch me there. You could direct email me at bodyfx, B-O-D-Y, the letter F is in Frank, the letter X is in X marks the spot, uh, the number two at AOL.com. Um, or on, on Facebook also, you could just look up Eric Broser and you can find me on there as well. So I'm pretty easy to find. And I have a show uh, on the Jay Cutler YouTube channel um, called Be Built by Broser. I've been on there for the last um, like five years. He's had me on there. Um, and I have, a, if you just go to playlists on his channel, there's like 95 shows on there where you can see a lot of my training. This way, a lot of stuff, you know, it's hard to describe it. When you see it visually, you can see a lot of the different angles that I use, a lot of the techniques that I'm talking about. Uh, beyond that, just that one training program I use. The, so you can see a lot of that stuff on there, too. And that will that'll give you some stuff that you can literally go right into the gym and go, let me try this. Yes, that's awesome. Uh, well, that about wraps it up for us. And thank you for coming on. I acknowledge both of you guys. Appreciate your time, David, and test your levels. And if you want to support us, you can leave a review or share this with somebody else. We're not doing this to make money. We're just doing this because we enjoy this. So any support you guys show us through sharing this with friends or taking the time and pressing the like button or leaving us a review is very helpful.